Good evening, everyone. I'm Jane Ransom, the Executive Director of the American Brain Foundation. The American Brain Foundation is a charitable foundation whose cause is curing brain disease. And based on science, we believe that the brain diseases are interconnected so that curing even one of these diseases opens up the possibility of curing many of them. We have a unique relationship and partnership with the American Academy of Neurology, our founder, the Science Committee of the Academy, which is the world's largest association of neurology, of neurologists, vets every single research grant we make making sure that we're funding the very best and brightest. Tonight, our theme is humanism in neurology with a spotlight on the recipient of the American Brain Foundation's Ted Burns Humanism and Neurology Award. And our moderator is Dr. Gordon Smith, who is Chair of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University former vice chair for research and chief of the neuromuscular division at University of Utah. His research focuses on peripheral neuropathy in diabetes and obesity. He's a former uh, board member of the American Academy of Neurology. And most importantly of all, he's a former member of the American Brain Foundation's board and a current member of our research advisory committee. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it over to you, Gordon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I see a lot of familiar names there, which is fantastic. So um, welcome. This is really a dual celebration. I think this is a celebration of the award, the Ted Burns Humanism and Neurology Award. And it's also a celebration of a truly remarkable individual uh, who is the recipient of this year's award. And so uh, let me perhaps provide a bit of an overview of how this evening's event will roll out. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Ted Burns Award, and then we'll get into really an interactive discussion with our panelists. And then we certainly welcome all of you to submit questions to engage. So um, uh, uh, the Ted Burns Award was really established in honor of a truly remarkable individual. And in, in, in thinking about this evening's event and how to really frame it, I actually went back to um, look at the definition of humanism. And at, at least for me, when I think humanism and medicine, I think of the uh, Arnold Gold Foundation. And so let me share with you the Arnold Gold definition of humanism and medicine, uh, which is uh, a characterization by a respectful and compassionate relationship between physicians and other members of the care team and their patients that reflects attitudes and behaviors that are sensitive to the values cultural and ethnic backgrounds of others. And uh, humanists have the following attributes, which they um, really uh, codify as CARES, uh, uh, or IE CARES. So integrity, excellence, collaborative and compassion, altruism, uh, respect and resilience, empathy and service. And so this sounds great. And I think as you hear a little more about Ted momentarily, and certainly learn about Dr. Quinlan and his work, all of these ring true. But um, I think uh, this award is truly special uh, at any time, particularly this year, because of, I think, unique attributes of, of Ted and, and his humanism. And uh, the, the award is working, and Stacy can talk about this because Dr. Quinlan exemplifies these. And if I had to add a, a letter to the, uh, the Gold Foundation definition of humanism, it would be courage. And uh, you know, for those of us who know Ted, for so many reasons, I can't think of anyone who is uh, is more courageous in so many ways. And um, I'll read from the um, uh, charge of the award, as it were, just to exemplify some of the unique attributes here. The award seeks to acknowledge the influence of the most benevolent and innovative in our field, who through their work advance the field of neurology and make knowledge more accessible through their innovative teaching. And this really captures Ted's passion uh, for education, but uh, the intent of the award is to do more than honor. So we are here to honor Dr. Quinlan tonight, to learn from him uh, and to, to engage in a conversation with him. Uh, but the award is really intended to inspire neurologists to improve healthcare delivery in the lives of their colleagues and patients now and in the future locally, 
uh, and nationally. And so uh, my hope tonight is that you'll enjoy the conversation with our panel, Drs. Clardy, Dr. Quinlan, uh, and that you'll be inspired by them and inspired by the example that uh, Ted has set for us all. Uh, and, and trying to introduce um, you know, who Ted Burns is to those of you who might not know him, that, that's an hour in and of itself or longer, but perhaps I can share a few comments that um, I've collected over time as we've established this uh, award to give you a picture of who Ted is. And, uh, and, and, and remember these because I think as we uh, talk with Dr. Quinlan, you'll see some common themes here. And so uh, one comment that Larry Phillips, who many of you know is a senior neuromuscular faculty member at the University of Virginia, made, we physicians often establish emotional barriers to distance ourselves from our patients in order to be objective. Ted doesn't do that. His example has taught me to be more open to my patients emotionally and to put myself in their shoes. Um, there, there's a really great quote from Jason Crowell, who I think is with us tonight, who has collaborated with Ted and I on a particular passion of Ted's and ours, which is drug pricing and the impact on our patients and communities. Uh, and, and Jason points out, that Ted is so special because of the thoughtfulness he, apply, he applies to everything he does. Every email, text, or comment is uh, carefully considered. I, I'll have to admit it's rather exhausting. There, there's, no, there's no small chit-chat with Ted. It's all substantive, which makes us all better. And in fact, um, uh, Jason comments that Ted is constantly seeking out ways to be a better leader to be more thoughtful in his actions. And he, he provides a number of quotes, which I'm proud to say two are in my office. One is don't just do something, stand there, uh, which is uh, a kind of a comment on the idea of monotask. And the other is an Abraham Lincoln quote, which is eliminate problems by plowing around the stump. Uh, but two that I think are really impactful. One, it's not a good pass if your teammate didn't catch it. Uh, and my favorite uh, that I think says a lot about Ted, which is uh, improve by 1% every day and focus on being kind. And uh, I, mean, I think those are really important comments, particularly in the context of the last year. Um, and so I, I think getting on the con uh, topic of the last year, it's been a remarkable journey in the last year and a half in, in so many ways. And I think if uh, there are two lessons I've learned, um, I think one is the power of science and the importance of science and uh, the need for us to protect science. Uh, but I think the other is the enormous value of what I'm going to call courageous humanism, aggressive, courageous humanism, which I think Ted has and I think Dr. Quinlan has. There's never a time we need this more than we do now. And uh, I think this award celebrates it. And it's, uh, I hope, going to inspire it uh, in you. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and let our panel talk. And so what I'd like to do is um, go ahead and introduce our panel to you. Uh, and start with someone I know really well, who is uh, Stacy Clarity. I worked at the University of Utah before moving to my current institution. Uh, Stacy is a um, is an acolyte of Ted Burns in many ways, uh, both in her approach to clinical care and her academic career. Uh, she also is uh, in charge of the Neurology Minute, the podcast Minute, which is a brainchild of Ted Burns. Uh, before anyone else was really thinking of these sort of informational microlearning opportunities, he would do it. Uh, Stacy is an innovator in her own right. Uh, she's an associate professor of neurology, a clinician and scientist at the University of Utah. Uh, she established the autoimmune neurology group there uh, and um, is a, a real master uh, educator. So Stacy, thanks for joining us. Maybe you can say a few comments as we get started. She also, I should point out, chaired the committee that selected Dr. Quinlan this year. Stacy. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. This is fantastic. I think one of the things that struck me, a lot of my notes that I made before this sort of echoed exactly what you said, some of the favorite quotes um, that have certainly changed my practice and probably saved me a good 10 years of wasted time just with a few pearls from Ted on how to, <laughs> how to get this neurology thing done in an effective way for our patients. Um, but one thing that struck me was really um, uh, when when we, you know, we get a lot of applications and when I was able to review John Quinlan's um, was how uh, similar the letters read um, to exactly the things you said about Ted. And that was just a ton of fun. It made the decision really quick and really easy. Um, and, and, you know, one of the funny things was um, 
after the award had been announced and, and I got to interview John Quinlan, actually, we did do a podcast with him, which you can all listen to. I'd encourage you to listen to it. It's when he's less on the spot, um, sort of talking about topics in humanism. And we did put that out a couple months ago. You can find that. But when I was talking to him sort of off air, um, and also when I was talking to Ted and sort of saying, Ted, do you know John? John, do you know Ted? And, and, and both of them had the exact same response after I sort of told them a little bit about each other. And, no, no, I don't, I don't travel much. But boy, I would really like to meet him. <laughs> Um, and, and it just sort of struck me as funny because they're both sort of sort of following incredibly similar approaches um, to education um, and, and to patient care. Um, so it, it's been a lot of fun. It's really been a privilege to do that. Um, so I don't, I don't want to take too much more time before we introduce John. I want you to hear from, from the man himself. Well, thanks, Stacey. Uh, John, let me just say a brief introduction and then hand it off to you to talk a little bit about um, your work. Uh, so, and I'm gonna keep this brief because we'll have plenty of time to explore your interests in the work you're doing. So uh, Dr. John Quinlan is the medical director of the Neuromuscular Center at the University of Cincinnati Neuroscience Institute. Uh, he's been with UC Health for a long time, since 1987. Uh, and he began at that time as the director of undergraduate medical education, and also as director of the EMG lab and co-director of the MBA clinic. And over time, um, as, I, as I read through his CV and the letters supporting his nomination, I think he's held every educational leadership role at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he's also won, um, I think, every education award that's possible. And in fact, I've had several complaints that there's no one, no, he wins all the awards. It's, uh, it's uh, He's so far out in front and is really a remarkable educator. And as I think we'll talk about an innovative educator, uh, he served as the director of the fellowship program in neuromuscular medicine in the EMG lab. Uh, he was the residency program director for some time. He uh, became director of the MDA clinic uh, in 2005 and was promoted to professor of neurology at that time. So John, uh, congratulations and welcome. I, I look uh, forward to our conversation and learning more and maybe you can just introduce yourself and perhaps fill in with a little color to the introduction I gave. Well, thanks so much for the award and thanks for the kind introduction. It was, it's great having Stacy as a co-panelist because she really relaxes me. It's very nice to have, have her share the Spotlight. Um, well, you know, I, I think I'm an academic neurologist and I had the good fortune of when I started at Cincinnati that uh, I was working in very the light neuromuscular disease, a good amount of general neurology, but I got handed the, uh, the wonderful task of uh, doing the clerkship for the medical students. So I would say that was my start in medical education and I really Love doing that over the years and seeing it go from something that was kind of haphazard to really things that are much more structured and, and effective and, and just a better educational experience. Along the way, I got to see, um, you know, in terms of running the residency for some years, looking at you know, training residents and then, um, you know, in the fellowships. So I really have, I mentioned to Stacy earlier that I've had the experience of. I really tried teaching all the way across the entire range of medical education. And even now it's a lot of fun to work with, with co colleagues and other disciplines in terms of collaborating, you know, and, and helping with their continuing, continuing medical education. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's one thing is keeping the clinical practice going, uh, kind of keeping your street cred in terms of you know, practicing and being able to teach others as a consequence. And then there's, there's just really nothing better than providing clinical care and, and teaching at the same time. Well, thanks, John. That's really great. And um, um, as we begin our conversation, I just want to remind um, all of the participants, you're welcome to participate. We really want you to put questions and you can do so uh, in the chat function and we'll pass them on to our, our panel. And, and maybe, um, we can start, John, by talking about your approach to medical education. I think one of the things that's um, distinctive in Ted's uh, humanism and leadership is the focus on education, not only education of students and residents, but patient education. Uh, what's your What's your vision for education? I mean, you clearly have won multiple awards. What's the secret sauce? Uh, tell us more about that. 
Well, you know, I, I really believe in keeping things simple and, and thinking about who you're teaching. So, I mean, when I look at a lecture that I don't like or I'm a little critical of, although I fairly share that, it's where people are teaching exceptions rather than the rules. And they're kind of confusing their audience. So I like to look at where the where the learner is. And that really goes, you know, ranging from the patient who might be another physician to somebody who really doesn't know a lot of the science. Um, so I, I think of education, at least of medical education, as being layer after layer where you're teaching the fundamentals. It's not so much what you say, it's what they remember and what they remember three months and six months down the line. So I, I look at things in a lecture and I think what justifies its space here? Is it something that is just interesting to me or is it gonna be something that's pretty high income? I, I have a kind of a rule on lectures. I say, the only things you'll hear me talk about are, are diseases that I've seen. Um, diseases or information that's gonna be on the boards um, or some principle that's really important. And I'm at a point now, if I haven't seen a disease in 30 years of neuromuscular and I'm doing that as, as a first, first year lecture, I mean, it's got no business being in the, on the list of items to be covered. And then when you're, you're working with residents, you're thinking about where they are. And then perhaps really enjoyable is when you teach fellows, because then you're, you're sitting down kind of side by side, one-on-one, -on -one, very, very strategic, looking at you know, just the different layers of medicine, medical practice that's going on all at the same time. So Stacy, what do you think? I know you're I'm interested in your perspective on this. You certainly spend a lot of time with medical education. I've seen you in action. You're very inspiring and motivating, although you'd constantly talk about diseases I've never seen, but maybe no. that's just because I hang out in neuromuscular clinic. No, I, you know, I appreciate this. And, and I think, um, you know, I think we all try to, to get better at education all the time. Something I'm struck about um, about listening to you, John. And when I, uh, I more often get texts from Ted. So, so I hear his voice in my head, but it's usually by text message. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I can tell it's sort of when he's doing something in passing and, and the thought struck him, but it's sort of uh, something I aspire to, but what, what to me marks the master educator, which you both have, have achieved is I don't think either of you realize that every interaction, even your minor interactions, because you've been and have clearly worked early on to craft it, but every interaction now has sort of become educational. Um, and that's, I think, maybe one of the differences, right? With, with the intersection of humanism and education, you know, I think, I think some some of us, you know, me included, we try very hard to sort of pack some educational points into what we're saying. And, and then it's almost kind of like, I, I check that off in teaching and move on to the next. But what I've noticed about you and Ted is that it's actually there and it's on a hundred percent of the time. And, and I wonder if, if you guys even realize that <laughs> if you've been at it so long, but, no. but I think that's, um, that's something that I appreciate and, and I think that is really rare. Um, you know, I'd also be interested to know, um, you know, I sort of have a, a question in mind, John, and that is, you know, I think this, this, this past 18 months, um, especially for the junior colleagues, boy, you know, it, it's, been, it's been rough, right? It's been rough on them. I think so many people have lost the fire, or the fire in the belly, if you will. Um, what sort of advice you have, how you've been approaching that, John, because you know, you're know you dealing with these folks, I'm sure they're coming to you and you're seeing the lows. And, and so how are, you, how are you sort of approaching that? How are you trying to refocus folks? What are you doing? Right, well, um, I'll tell you, I'm struggling with that. And the reason is that- Why? You know, <laughs> okay, um, the reason is um, that in the old days when you're in the trenches, and you're right beside people that are working so hard. And so I've been quarantined for, you know, until I got my shots and could come out. And so there was a feeling, I have to say, of guilt where, you know, I know the, the young people, young faculty that are in there caring for the patients, 
not with insignificant risk. And so first of all, it's really hard to say, uh, keep it going when you're in a very protected area. You know, so I have to say that it's, it's tough on that front. Now, um, I think to do what you can is, um, I'll give you an example. Um, um, we, we had a, um, a colleague uh, who was trying to set up an interdisciplinary clinic for patients with pulmonary and neuromuscular diseases. And she was really getting beat up and, and really was having a tough time getting people lined up. And it's sort of an example of innovation and technology, but you could just see that we needed to get together uh, as a group. And we did it virtually. And the email requests kind of went out at four o'clock and the people were signing onto the meeting at 4.15. And so I think those are things where you can help each other, where when there's a, there's a request for help and you respond to it as quickly as possible. Now we didn't solve the problem, but kind of like Ted would say, you know, we maybe made a 2% improvement on that. And with an idea of maybe getting it, you know, 15% better by the, uh, by, the, by the next three months. But just telling people that you hear them and that you can try to help is a good thing. And then also, I mean, from my perspective, I'm looking at a situation where I can't help in certain physical ways or before I was vaccinated in a way that could pitch on clinical care. It's try to take other duties that can help plan or make things more efficient, but just trying to pitch in and I'll listen. I, I might not have been listening as much to my section as I should have. You know, I, I try to schedule things where we, we almost where we, we schedule talks. But I have to say, I, I, I should have been, I should be talking more, I should be talking more with them than I am. So maybe we can shift gears a little bit. I think um, I think some participants may know, John, that you have muscular dystrophy. And um, I think this is something you share with Ted, who obviously um, has health issues that he's working through with uh, tremendous courage. And I'm, I'm curious um, the extent to which your experience as a patient or as a person who has a neurological uh, disease um, informs your teaching and, and how it informs your care of patients? What is that, How important is that? How is that integrated into your professional life? You know, um, oddly enough, it, uh, it doesn't really inform my teaching too much. But I, I mean, it, it, sometimes it's it's a it's been an advantage, an odd advantage, the weaker I get, because you know so often I think a teacher does too much and observes not as much. So when you're talking, when you're teaching somebody, so to be over their shoulder and guiding them while they're doing something, it's really a nice teaching opportunity. So I guess I've been pretty opportunistic. You know, if I look at something I can't do, I think about it. Is there is there even a uh, unexpected advantage of that. So for example, teaching EMG needle exam, when you're looking at working with a colleague and you've got over the basics, and then you're sort of really giving them fine tips in terms of where they are and where they should be doing. All the same, it's kind of fun and interesting because patients are, um, you're always clearing with the patient, is this okay if we, shop, we talk shop? But you're, you're always kind of talking to the patient and the resident at the same time. So you're teaching a lot of different lessons simultaneously. Um, I think when I, I have patients where they are um, having disabilities, uh, it, it can be an advantage in, in terms of, you know, for, for in the most basic level, you know a lot of the solutions. So in terms of mobility assist, what works, what doesn't, some quick solutions for, you know, adjust, you know, modifying your bathroom, you know. Just so it, having those, having gone through all phases of going from needing uh, ankle braces to needing a wheelchair, you sort of know all those steps very well. So that's that's uh, that's definitely an advantage. So maybe uh, something that struck me in reading through um, the materials about your work is the innovation you've brought to medical education. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I was impressed with the idea for a neurology passport, which is great branding, but an interesting concept, and maybe the importance of education innovation. I think Ted exemplifies this, and 
you know, I, Ted has been years ahead of trends, and I think it seems like you have a similar perspective. Maybe you can tell us a little bit of more, more about innovation and education and the importance of that in your career. Yeah, well, I mean, the passport, it's an interesting way. And I think we who teach in medical education, we know how difficult it is to teach and grade at the same time and then archive the, the performance. So it's a very simple system where a student would write in um, an initial for the patient and then you would get scored on history, physical exam, differential diagnosis down the line. And then you you get three points. And my rule of thumb is if I can teach you something important, I'm going to dock you a point if you missed it. So as soon as they get a, they get an idea of me, then they, they just up their game. But that way, but it has to be something important. And it's something that they missed something on the history that was important in narrowing the differential diagnosis. So it, it's not just something that I think is important. It's something that I can show how to get into. Um, and then if they got it pretty good, but they missed, if they, and then if they, so they get a three if it's no, didn't miss anything, a two if they've missed one thing, and a one if they've missed two things, and if they've got a zero, I'm wondering if they, if we saw the same patient, you know, because they have nothing on the history that's similar. Now, I have to go off on a, just a, a story that one time I had a patient, we were in the intensive care unit, and the student does this presentation, and we were, you know, in our, our workroom, and then we went to the patient's bedside. And the patient was in a coma, and the patient had presented the patient. And when we looked at this patient, he was, he was talking. I mean, he was following instructions. And I said, this is fantastic. And then the student said, Dr. Quinlan, I examined the wrong patient. I examined the guy over there. <laughs> uh, and I said, so, but Stacey, in line with your um, comment about being opportunistic and thinking about teaching moments, I said, that is fantastic because I really want to compliment you on your honesty. Because, I mean, this can be a disaster if you don't just say, this is going to hurt, but I have to tell the truth. And, and so it was an opportunity because, I mean, we have all done something like that. Uh, I, well, I personally have. And so to teach the person that the most important lesson to remember is just own up to it right away because you don't want anybody to get hurt. And, and then also as a teacher, you really have to, I think, respond in that manner to compliment and encourage you know, honesty and, and that. Um, so that, that's, um, but the passport is, uh, it's an interesting tool. Gordon, that's a you, great story. You, great, have you, yeah. Gordon, have you made similar mistakes or we don't have to go into them right now? Oh, I've made tons of mistakes. Um, and I, I, the one that I just, I'm having a flashback to as an intern, I um, um, had to float a Swan Gans catheter by myself. So I'm in the unit. I float this catheter and I get it and I'm so proud and I want to show the fellow when I look down and for those of you who remember these, I didn't put the sleeve on. And so I had to pull the whole thing out and had to own it up to the fellow. Yeah, I actually floated it perfectly, but then I had to pull it up because I screwed up and didn't check off the first part of putting the sleeve and that I'm not going to share others. I'd ask Stacy to share, but I know she's never made a similar mistake to, uh, to, to you and me, but I think this is a really great, uh, opportunity to pivot a little bit and talk about, you know, uh, education of humanism, right? And, and and you're talking about concepts of ethics and responsibility and ownership. And I mean, you're here because you've demonstrated tremendous humanism. Um, is this a teachable skill? How do, how do you go about, um, you know, teaching students to demonstrate that honesty and, and recognize their error which I think in some ways is foundational to the sorts of skills that, you know, I outlined at the beginning in the award and I think what you've exemplified. And I'd love to hear Stacy's perspective on this too. Stacy, do you want to go first? Sure. I'll just lead in and say, I kind of have it underlined, Gordon. I have the same question because your letter writer said, I can think of no person who has greater integrity. That's a, that's a pretty strong statement. And, and, and then he kind of went on to say, and even as I write this letter, I'm not sure I've fully captured his impact on others as a human being. Um, and and that's 
you know, that, that's a, that's something we all want. So, so tell us, John, <laughs> it's the secret well, sauce. Well, um, there's, you know, in clinical practice, um, uh, you know, I, I like to teach sort of procedure and being very systematic, but you also have to step back and say, does that sound right? You know, is the right diagnosis? We step back on it. You don't just want to go through the steps. You want to let's say, hey, does that fit? And I think in an ethical situation, when you're doing something, you have to stop and think, is that the right thing to do? And, and that is that good for the patient? And a lot of times that you have to think long term on that. And so it's just that that sort of final check on what you're going to do. Or and the, you know, and you just and the other one, I, we have an interesting ethics seminar where um, we have our students, we it's one of their assignments is to come up with an ethical case in the course of the month. Um, you write a one page essay but it's got to be double or triple spaced because we don't like to read too much. And then we discuss those cases uh, in a seminar and it's, 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 really, um, it's really a good exercise. Um, and there's the four ethical principles that, and we try to use the jargon, but one that comes up is honesty. It's not one of the, it's, it's foundational to all the ethical principles, but you know, you have to tell the truth. You know, sometimes when you're looking at, um, you know, autonomy and explaining things. So uh, I guess it's, you know, I do think ethics can be taught. I think they can be, I think, well, I, sh I should say, I think they can be encouraged and, and they can flourish. And I think you can, I uh, think in a, in a bad situation, you can drive ethical principles out of a person. Um, and so that's something to try to, um, to recognize, I think. So, um uh, Stacy's brought up your letter writer, and so we have a, a bit of a surprise guest here for you, John. I'm just going to, uh, as uh, Dr. Casella warms up his microphone, I'm going to provide a couple quotes from what I think is the most remarkable letter I honestly have ever read. And I, I don't know about you, I, I have to write letters all the time, and God knows I have to read letters. And um, um, I, you know, and I know Brett well, and Brett, Brett, he's not the most eloquent person, and yet he put forth this spectacular letter for you. It was truly remarkable, and I think it really captures you, and I'm, of course, joking about Brett, who's far more eloquent than I, but I just want to read a couple of quotes and then ask Brett to come on and, and talk a little bit about you in a way that might be positively embarrassing. And just a couple of quotes that I really liked were, one, we consider him a jewel whose sparkle locally excites students to pursue neurology and neurology residents to be ethical and accomplished neurologists. What a great sentence. And then another, and, and the letter is full of these, uh, and I, I could spend the next 10 minutes reading it, but, and even as I write this letter, I'm not sure that I've fully captured his impact on others as a human being. It is very hard for words to adequately express, not unlike the immense impact that Ted has had on me, even as a colleague who has seen him only intermittently over the years. So um, I, I'm going to ask Brett to next my, write my next promotion letter. But Brett, maybe you can uh, make some comments here, because uh, what a powerful, powerful description of uh, Dr. Quinlan. Well, thanks, Gordon. I'm definitely going to write you a lousy letter after calling me not eloquent, but uh, just kidding. Gordon and I are friends for, for many, many years, uh, dating back to our training. And uh, John, surprise, um, uh, Gordon asked me to come here, and I, I was going to attend anyway, but I'm just so pleased to be able to say a few words uh, uh, about, about you. Um, I meant every word I wrote in the letter, uh, and I want to make sure you have a copy of it, I'll tell you that. But um, this, this award for me is just the intersection of karma, right? Um, I... I uh, consider myself a friend of Ted, uh, friend of Ted Burns for many, many years. Uh, we came up together as residency program directors early in my career. I was residency program director, as was Ted. Uh, we were good friends and colleagues, and, and uh, he, in fact, sucked me into being in his first group of podcast people with the AAN, and um, that was one way that, I mean, I, I one of the most remarkable demonstrations of humanism was Ted's interview about what it was like to be a patient when he first got diagnosed with cancer and had some of his initial treatments. And if you, if there's one podcast you listen to along with John, so that's two podcasts you have to listen to, um, listen to that one. I can tell you among the people on the podcast, we all fought to see if we could be the one to interview Ted. 
Um, and it's just one of the most remarkable things I've ever heard. So Ted, love you. Um, and I was so pleased to see this award from American Brain Foundation, Ted's honor, because it's just, it's perfectly fitting. But then for me, when I got, I knew immediately I wanted to write and, uh, and, and put forth John as a candidate for this because he's meant so much to our department, um, to me personally as a faculty member, to every medical student in training that's ever been through the University of Cincinnati. Uh, when I arrived at UC, um, John was the residency program director and student director of the student rotation. Um, and we decided after about a year of me being his associate program director that I would take over the residency program and John would do students. And I can't tell you um, how much I valued um, John is a colleague um, and mentor uh, in the educational world and, and how much he meant to, again, all our trainees. And as a re as residency program director, you want the students to fall in love with neurology and want to work in your program. And that's a real bonus when John Quinlan is your medical student director because he is just truly beloved by all the students. And in a college of medicine where there's thou a thousand faculty, um, John has won the Teacher of the Year Award, the Golden or the Silver Apple. John, what are we up to? Like 12? Um, 12 different times. It's like an orchard of teaching apples. Um, I now, as the chair of the department, I get to write his annual uh, progress review uh, at the end of each year. Um, I threaten to put him on a performance improvement plan if he does not win the apple because it's a terrible step down from the prior year. And then he usually has a rebuttal like, oh, you can't win it two years in a row, so you can't really do that to me. Um, but I mean, uh, talk about a person who um, is an amazing clinician. Uh, imagine the empathetic way that he dealt with patients who have neuromuscular disease. I mean, I'll share one pearl. I had the privilege of hearing John talk to a patient once about getting a second opinion. And as you know, uh, we're humans and we can make mistakes, and, but we want the right thing for our patients. And John's words to the patient were, of course, you should get a second opinion. I never mind if someone checks my work. Your health is the most important thing that I care about. And I've used that, John, countless times. Um, I think of you every time that I do it. Um, as an educator, there's no better. Um, and, you know, he challenges all of us to be better educators. I'm pleased to see several of our trainees, uh, fellows and re past residents and fellows on the call tonight, and um, they know uh, what I'm talking about. But um, John has made us better. John really has been one of the foundations upon which our department, which was very small when I got there and has gotten bigger, was built. Um, and um, I'll stop. I'm rambling on, but I'll tell you, I just can't say enough good things about John. This award is perfect. And for me, it's the the perfect match to my good friend, Ted, and the spirit of this award. And so thank you for letting me say a few words, John. Congratulations. Uh, I love you. And um, this is something you totally deserve, my friend. Thank you so much, Brett. Really, thanks. Um, if it's OK, I'll like so I, to I'm, I froze there for a minute. I apologize. Uh, Brett, I have a. Oh, please do. Perfect. Hi, let me introduce myself first. My name is Ikje, and I'm currently an uh, assistant professor at Columbia University in Neuromuscular Division, and I'm one of the many JQ kids, probably on the younger side. I did my residency training in Cincinnati and also my neuromuscular fellowship uh, in the same institution. So uh, I'm so happy to see JQ here. And I'm so happy that he's staying strong throughout this COVID pandemic. Uh, as Brett said, um, I was a, a little bit worried about uh, his health and I really want you to live long, <laughs> as long as possible. Uh, so I'd like to say a couple things about JQ. I know he has so many strengths, he's a fantastic neurologist. But to me, the strength that makes him outstanding an educator is his patience, I think. So he really has uh, great patience with students, with residents, with fellows, and that really helps us learn. Because as you can imagine, in the beginning of the learning curve, we know nothing, we don't know much. And it's not about telling something, it's not about facts, it's not about kind of putting those knowledge into you. He always give us time to think with cases with patients with the diagnosis with the management and really brings the best out of us really makes us work on what we can and after you achieve those 
there's this tremendous sensation of accomplishment that gives you confidence and positive motivation. So you keep on working to get better, better as a neurologist, better as a doctor, and better as a, everything. So I think that really kind of uh, motivated me throughout the residency. But really, the reason I went into neuromuscular medicine is really, I want to say, because of JQ. I enjoyed thoroughly my first EMG rotation. And then I was already having fun with EMGs. And because JQ has some physical uh, you know, limitation while doing EMGs, he would grab me in my third year and fourth year for complicated inpatient cases. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. It was so much fun. Um, we'll do the nerve conductions together. He'll let me do the needle EMG. And after I see some findings, of course, he will have all the time in the world to discuss with me that uh, made the whole process uh, very, very uh, interesting and learning. Uh, as, as an assistant professor, and you know, I'm now teaching my residents and students, I realized that how, how difficult it is to find a lot of time to spend. Uh, you're always you know, seeing patients, doing uh, notes, administrative works, researches, you, time is really scarce and you always want to finish work in time and in the clinic during the consult service it's just difficult to find enough time to spend with residents and fellows and students now i look back i i now realize how how precious the time jq spent with me and with other students and other um, residents and how much that nurtured me and i can't say uh, enough Thank you for Jake. Oh, Big Jay, thanks so much. And the thing is that so much of the teaching goes both ways, uh, you know, in terms of learning from you. And it, when you're teaching and, and providing clinical care at the same time, those are the, those are the greatest times uh, because you just see the return on investment, which is treat, you know, developing future generations. So thanks so much, Big Jay, for the, those kind words. And now, for those of you who aren't watching the um, the chat, so Dr. Lee, what great comments! Thank you for for making them. They're not only um, I would say uh, you know, as a, a comment in and of itself, really positive, but it's a great example of the impact of mentorship and education and playing it forward. And uh, Dr. Casella pointed out that Dr. Lee is one of this year's clinical research training scholarship awardees for ALS uh, through the American Brain Foundation. So. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Lee, and uh, thank you to the foundation, Jane, uh, Dr. Dodick, for supporting uh, such great work. Uh, there's a really great question in the chat from Bonnie. And Bonnie, would you like to ask your question directly? I'm happy to read it, but I think it'll be more powerful perhaps coming directly from you. It's a great question. Sure. And I'm pretty sure this isn't a typical example of most of the doctors here on this um, conference this evening. Um, my question is, I'm an advocate for uh, those with a dementia diagnosis, and which includes myself. And my, when I saw the title, uh, Humanism in Neurology, um, that really intrigued me. So my question is, I hear so many of my um, friends that I've met through my advocacy work, say that when they received a diagnosis, whether it be Alzheimer's, Lewy body, et cetera, et cetera, that they received the diagnosis and then they were told by their neurologist to go get their affairs in order. And I hear this over and over and over again, and it really, really kind of concerns me. My neurologist did not say that. He told me I had white matter disease and to go live my life. So um, what happens oftentimes is the patient goes home and then we instantly start scouring the internet, which of course is probably not the right thing to do, but I left the office without any information, any resources. I didn't even know what white matter disease was at the time that I left. So I was just curious um, in the education process, what does it look like or sound like when, I mean, how are, I guess my question is, are they taught and or do they practice? Do you know, how are 
how do you teach someone to deliver a diagnosis? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Oh no, that's a that's a really good question. And you know, um, in our area, you know, we're dealing with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. So it'd be the sort of similar situation where it's a very very serious diagnosis. And I mean, I try to. I mean, I've thought about this when I was starting out, and how do you how do I do it better? And I found that I was more comfortable saying, I'm afraid that this is a situation because rather, you know, it's more, you're talking about it more from the patient's side. And then you're, and you're also, there's always a certain uncertainty, you know, in terms of the diagnosis, but you really have to be honest with the patient and tell, in terms of telling them what the, you think is the diagnosis. So that's one way. I think it's just a simple phrasing and that, that can be important. The other thing is with ALS, you know, I, you know, the person might say, well, how long do I have to live? I said, really, what we want to do is, is get the most out of life. So you know, how, when you're looking at our plans right now, you want to get the most amount of living. And so then we talk about that, things that you want to do. And it really comes to looking at the patient, looking at the things that are important to them, and then, and then doing them. Uh, and I, I also usually put in a little something extra. This is... Um, I say, if you do something that you really want to do, do it again. <laughs> there's, there's no rule that doesn't say you, you don't do a repeater on that. Now, so those would be similar things that we do in, in neuromuscular. And then of course, you know, when I'm working with our fellows, you know, you sit down afterwards and you discuss those things with your colleagues. And then that's how you, you teach it is really not with a, a lecture so much as a you know, working with a patient and then sitting down afterwards and thinking about it. A great question, thank you. And Bonnie, thanks, that's such a great question. And there's another comment that I'm going to, to read, John, that I think it aligns with this. And I think we're, there's a theme here. And, and this is from uh, one of our, our friends on the Zoom whose husband lived with Lewy body dementia. So another very challenging diagnosis, obviously not neuromuscular, but one with which you have familiarity, uh, who comments, I would have loved to have had someone explain what was going on with his brain. And that all I got was, well, that's the progression, it's worse. Um, and so I, I think you've kind of conveyed how you approach this situation. But of course we see patients who been through this experience, which is really extremely challenging. And I wonder, two questions for you. How do you, what, what do you say to Donna who brings this up? Uh, and then um, to follow up on Bonnie's question, how do we best prepare our learners not to make this mistake in communication with our patients? How, how do we prepare them to have the conversation you've talked about? Well, uh, let me just kind of talk about our, our learners first. Uh, you know, right now, I'm, I'm for the last five years or so, I've, I've worked with our first year students in our learning community. And so really, I think it has to start out very early. And our, I think our training is better now than it was in the past in terms of thinking about the effects of our words and how we uh, have to be careful about it. And just, you know, that thing about uh, think how what it would be like to hear this if you're on the receiving end. Um, let's see, uh, you know, I'll tell you this thing about conveying scientific information to the patient. I always want to uh, work on clear vocabulary, you know, and being accurate. But you know, you know, when you're looking at some of these diseases, we don't understand them ourselves. So, so in terms of trying to explain to the patient, it's difficult. I remember one of my patients with ALS. Um, the man who her husband was in heating and air conditioning. And he, he said, how can this be that you don't know what's going on uh, with this disease after so many years? And I was just thinking from his perspective, I said, sir, so when you come in and you, you're asked to do something, I understand where you're coming from because when something's broken, you fix it and heat is on and, and it doesn't seem reasonable that we shouldn't be able to do the same thing with these diseases. But you know, it's just, we didn't build it. And, you know, it's just, it's acknowledging our ignorance. And then kind of moving pretty quickly over to, you know, how can we make the best of this, this situation? Because some situations are just, they're just tough. 
Ted, who I think is with us tonight, has found a kindred spirit. And um, I hope you guys have the opportunity to connect. And I think, um, I don't know, my metric of success for tonight was to leave inspired. And um, I think most people are. And I really want to, uh, you know, thank, um, you know, the questions that came in or the, the people who asked these questions. They're really, uh, really great. Um, this award, which I think is serving its purpose of inspiring last year, John Stone, this year, Dr. Quinlan, uh, is not yet fully endowed. And so we still need further contributions to, to pull this off. We're not very far away. Uh, you know, Jane Ransom can, I think, probably give us a sense of how far we are away, but not far. And so I would encourage everyone, if you've been inspired tonight, if, if you listen to Dr. Quinlan and think that's who I want my doctor to be, or this is something I want to model in my patient care, please consider donating to the American Brown Fa Brain Foundation to finish off this endowment. You know, I've made my annual giving to the ABF allocated for this. For those of you who are neurologists, you can use your speaker honoraria uh, to do this. So help us get this across the finish line so it's fully, uh, fully endowed. So that's my pitch for the evening. Uh, but David, maybe I can hand it off to you uh, to make some comments just about the ABF. And, uh, and uh, this is my way of thanking you for those of us who are good friends and colleagues of Ted Burns and John Quinlan. Uh, we really want to thank you and the foundation for making this possible. Well, Gordon, thank you so much. And thank you for doing such a superb job of hosting this, uh, this event this evening. And Stacy, thank you for, for being here as well. John, I must say, sitting here, I'm, I'm just completely humbled and inspired by the impact, listening to the words from Brett and Stacy and Gordon, the impact that you've had on so many trainees is just phenomenal. And the impact that you've had on so many lives over the course of your career, and then in turn, the lives that you're impacting through the people that you've taught, not only the science of medicine, but the art of medicine. And I'm just completely inspired to be better. Well, thank you uh, so much. And it's such a great job. It's such a fun, great job to do. Well, just congratulations. And I'm on behalf of the American Brain Foundation, I can't imagine anybody better uh, to have received this award. Um, as, as Gordon said, this, this award is not fully endowed yet, but you can see why it's so important to endow an award like this. Because, you know, as someone sitting here today, I had two of my closest family members who were patients today. We'll all be patients. And those closest to us and those we love most will be patients. And so I'm, I was sitting for most of the day on pins and needles wondering what's happening. And so, you know, I would want a physician looking after my loved ones, just like you, John. And that's, that's why this is so important. So thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. Congratulations again. And uh, we couldn't be more proud to be giving this award to you. Thank you so much. So before handing it off to Jane to, to finish off the evening, Emily has kindly put the link in the chat uh, regarding how to donate to the Ted Burns Award. If you don't see the link, look in the chat or you can just go to AmericanBrainFoundation.org and it'll be on the website. So Jane, uh, maybe you can carry the football across the finish line for us here. Thank you very much for, for attending tonight and for your support. Um, and we hope we'll see you back again uh, for our next month's uh, virtual salon on sports concussions.